And so can you talk a little bit about the book, um, Sexual Fluidity? Sure. Because I think this is <laughs> where you were leading. Um, it received a lot of academic and mainstream media attention. Um, so can you tell me in your view what is the most significant impact of, of this book? And then I have a few other follow-up Well, probably. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that, you know, over the years as I've been doing this longitudinal study, periodically some of my participants would be like, oh, send me any anything you've written on this because I find the study interesting. So I would send them my little academic articles, which of course are horribly boring if you're not, you know, an, an academic. <laughs> and and a lot of my, uh, my responses would say that was really good, but it'd be great if there was like a more accessible form of this because a lot of them really got what I was trying to do, mm -hmm. and and a lot of them said, "Wow, you know, I really thought I was the only person with this, you know, this strange bisexual past, or I'm a lesbian who fell in love with a man, like." I thought I was the only one. I thought it was so strange, and I'm and I, it's so nice talking to you and realizing that I'm not so strange. It's very comforting. So they got that notion that wow, I, you know, I am being rep represented here, mm -hmm. and they would say, but I'd love to be able to communicate this to friends and family and colleagues in a way that's a little easier than these journal articles. So. Um, and one one of my respondents said, "I wish there was a like something I could give to my mother that would explain this." And so when I when I decided to write the book, that was the sort of voice in my head, something that my respondents themselves could easily get, and something they could give to their mother, you know, something they could give to their cousin, something that they could hand to somebody and say, "You think I'm so strange? Look, I'm not so strange. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of us strange folk." out there. And that was, and so that was really my goal, was I, I produced plenty of academic publications. I felt like I had already gained as much, you know, sort of traditional legitimacy as I could gain. And so I was not out for that. I was not, you know, um, I was not seeking that. I was not writing this book for an academic art audience. There's no graph. There's no table in it. Um, there are very few numbers in it. Um, I wanted to find a way to, to communicate the, the basic message of, of this capacity, this more expansive notion of sexuality, and this more complicated notion of sexual development to the average everyday mm -hmm. person. And it was hard. I mean, if you know, you, you're in academia, academia and you learn to speak a certain way, and it was hard to sort of change your voice to that more, you know, accessible level. And it's funny because I thought like I was like I was like really trying to to pare down the language and make it accessible and um and I thought I thought I did a pretty good job and my mom's like, You think that's accessible? <laughs> like you have a funny notion of accessible, you know, it's still pretty high pollutant. So you know, it's like these things are, you know, you, yeah. you do what you can. But that was my my motive was to Communicate this to a more um, to a more general audience, not an academic audience, not an intellectual audience at all. Yeah, and, and so can you talk? I mean, you were on Oprah, and can you yeah. talk a little bit about some of the experiences? I have kind of two question, two prong questions about this. Is first about what is the experience of communicating it to a mainstream audience, and the oh. second part of the question is about you know I think I heard you talk or maybe I read something about how sometimes those research findings get taken Yeah, that, that was why I was like kind of rolling my eyes because because my experience has been both positive and negative. Yeah. Um, the moment I started doing this research and, and started finding the kind of variability and change over time that, that I found, I was aware from the very beginning that um, this was a potentially political kind of hot potato because the rhetoric about choice of blah, 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 blah. And even though it was clear to me from my data that the women who were experiencing changes were not choosing those changes, that they often, you know, described it almost like weather systems. Like they didn't, you know, they're like, I fell in love with someone. I did not choose it. It happened to me. I knew that in the simplistic way that things were described, um, that the culture has a very different understanding of, 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 of change. So, um, I was concerned about two things. I was concerned about the research being misused by people who actually had an anti-gay agenda. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned about the research being viewed unfavorably by my own community of, 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 of queer folk and, and feminists who were like, don't you realize that you're handing them on a platter this argument that, oh, sexual orientation can change. 
I was totally surprised by the fact that I have never, never gotten a negative response from within the community. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I was giving voice to something that everybody knew was out there. Mm -hmm. Every single response I've gotten from the community has been, thank God someone's finally talking about this in a more nuanced way, like from within. Like, you know, that things change, and it's not because we choose it, it's because sexuality is complicated. So I've only ever gotten an unbelievably warm embrace from the community. Um, that I think really testifies to the importance of giving voice to the voiceless because I think that's what they really responded to was, mm -hmm. wow, we have not been doing a good job of communicating the diversity of our community and, and this is work that, that does that. So thank God that that happened because I was so worried about that. But um, as I feared, my findings end up on sort of conservative websites and uh, and stuff like that all the time. That mm -hmm. if sexuality is fluid, then that means that it's choice and that you know therefore it doesn't deserve you know rights or whatever. So um, I I had to think really long and hard about what then my role is as a scientist in the public sphere. Because I'm not stupid enough to think that I'm producing some objective scientific knowledge. Like my, my feminist perspective already, you know, prepared me for the fact that the work I produce is in a social context and I can't pretend like, oh, I'm above it all. I just produced the science and then I'm, you know, because that is total bunk. But it still raises the question of, well, then what is my role? How involved do I become? And um, so over the years, my approach has just to be, I think, more aggressive than the field of psychology trains you to be mm -hmm. about uh, communicating what my findings do and do not mean and correcting the record when it's distorted. Um, I still think that the, the discipline of psychology and the discipline of, you know, of, of just science in general says, well, you can't prevent that stuff, so don't worry too much about it, and don't sully yourself by getting involved in those conversations. You know, if you get too involved, then you're viewed as an advocate and not as a scientist, and that hurts your credibility, so, uh, so don't do it. But... I think that they, you know, and I understand the rationale for that argument, but I think that in my case, with the topic as controversial as the topic that I study, um, that that's just unethical. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just unethical. And I can't prevent, you know, yeah, I put my stuff out there, I can't prevent how it's used, but it's my research and it's my data, and I believe it's my responsibility to. Um, to communicate it very aggressively to not just to other scientists but to the public at large and I think that's for me the critical thing is that and that's the sort of feminist activist part of me is that I'm producing this work not just for the sake of academia but because it, it lives in the public sphere, it lives in the public domain I have a responsibility to the community that I study to communicate my findings accurately to them before somebody else does it wrong. So you know, I feel like my sort of version of feminist engagement, you know, ethically obligates me and, and gives me the responsibility to be more aggressive about being the one to communicate what I think my findings mm -hmm. imply and what I don't think they imply. But that's hard because um, you can't catch all of it, you know, it's the internet's out there and who knows, you know, what floats around. Um, 